Welcome to episode 104, Knit a Spell fans. Woo! Yay! This week, we dive into some of Jim's favorite guest moments from season two. Much like last week where I dove into mine, this week Jim shares episodes that I didn't necessarily pick so that we could make sure we share even more great moments with you guys. And why are we doing this? Because April is... It's Knit Bell's birthday! Two years on the air every week. I can't believe and it. And I still like you. I still like you. And in fact, I like you even more. In fact, I might even love you. Oh, this is a beautiful love that we have. I appreciate you so much, Jim. I just podcast to say I love you. Oh, I hope we never get sued for all the songs that we sing on here slightly differently. Uh, They're satirical, right? That's a thing. I don't think we can be. <laughs> Light from Lantern presents Knit a Spell. I'm magical maker, Katie Rempe. And I'm the maker of magic, James Devine. Join us as we stitch together the symbiotic relationship between crafting and the craft. Who have you picked this week, Jim? I'm so curious. Episode 61. We had Nicholas Pearson. You can find him at The Luminous Pearl. We talked about crystals of protection. Remember we had this conversation. Mm. I wonder what gems or crystals were really protective. Yeah. And we thought, oh, I know who we should have on. We should see if Nicholas Pearson, who is an amazing author, he's written, what, seven or eight books? Oh, man, probably more by now. Including Crystal Basics. Yes. Such a fantastic book here. Yes. I mean. The book on crystals. Get it today. Do it. And oh, my gosh, of course, he was delighted to come onto the podcast. What do we think about when we think about protection? We think about black tourmaline or we think about hematite. Didn't he surprise both of us? when he talked about Labradorite because of, wait, I don't want to ruin it. Let's let Nicholas tell you in this clip. Some of the other stones that I like to use for protection are things that have maybe some interesting optical phenomena that give us clues as to how they might interact with, say, capital L light because of how they interact with lowercase l light, if that makes sense. So something like Labradorite, Labradorite has this effect like diffraction grading. So as light penetrates, it gets scrambled and then we it's, see beautiful Isn't colors. it called labradorescence? <laughs> Don't they yeah. call it that? Yeah. Labradorescence oh. is that phenomenon exhibited in this stone from its unique makeup. Right. It's that luminous quality that Labradorite has that we would maybe call iridescence. But it actually, I think it's really cool that it actually has a name in Labradorite called Labradorescence. And what's nifty versus iridescence, which is like a superficial thing, Labradorescence occurs because of something called an immiscibility gap. So Feldspar is a big family. It includes Labradorite and Moonstone and Sunstone, lots of other things. But here's something that might blow our minds a bit. Like sunstone and moonstone are phenomena. They're not substances. So any number of substances, when they demonstrate those optical phenomena can be called those things. So with the property of labradorescence, it's typically found in labradorite, but it can also be found in other things that do the same thing. So we have these layers. They call them laminae from like the Latin word to laminate, to bond together. And they, they intermingle. And depending on the relative width of those individual layers, they will bend light in slightly different directions because they have different refractive indices. The width of it will be related to the wavelength of light that we perceive. If it's much wider, we're going to see red. If it's much narrower, we're going to see like blue and violet. So the thinner the layers, the shorter the wavelength of light gets through to our eyes. That's how we perceive it. Even though none of those pigments are in the stone, there's no chemical in there that changes the color. It's all like a trick of the light, but it's the fact that it deals with boundaries. It is the boundary between these two closely related things that are not the same. And so in our own energy field, it does something similar. It reminds my aura where its boundaries begin and end. So that way I'm not taking on other people's crud to use a technical term even though my energy field resembles someone else's quite a lot they're distinct they're separate and so labradorite allows that boundary to be there a selectively permeable membrane there are some things that can come and go certain wavelengths that pass with ease and others get scrambled and filtered out that is helpful because boundaries allow us to remain whole boundaries allow us to express unconditional love without having to sacrifice ourselves because that doesn't mean we have to have unconditional relationships. If we have these unconditional relationships, we can't practice self-care. And at the end of the day, self-care is community care. So Labrador, it's a really great stone. If we tend to show up better for other people than we show up for ourselves, it's just enough of a reminder to say, Hey, have you taken a step back yet today? This burden you're carrying, I don't think that came from you. Would you like to put it down? Okay, let's do that. 
So Katie, that blew your mind too, right? I think about it all the time. And I always carry my moonstone with me now for those labrad labro oh, good luck saying that one. Labradorescence. Due to the labradorescence. That's yes. right. Your mind will be blown throughout that episode. Episode 61, Chris is a protection with Nicholas Pearson. Go back and listen. We talk a little bit about how rose quartz we don't know why it's pink. So many great stories. He's a so, real expert and a joy to listen to. Yes. He blends the metaphysical and the scientific together in a way that's beautiful. I know it's one of your favorites too. Absolutely. Up next is my selection from our month of tarot and Oracle deck creators. Remember, we had an entire month where we talked about Oracle decks and tarot decks. Of course, the Northern Animal Tarot with Linda Ritter, episode 67. She is a dream. She talks about why she chose to feature animals instead of humans in her deck. Why did she choose to do that? You got to listen to this. It's a fascinating answer. How did this project become in your purview? You're like, oh, I like tarot. I'm going to make my own deck. Yeah, I definitely went more into silk screening and design, but never forgot about like fairy tales stories. I still loved movies that were more like fantasy based. But then I was at a cafe and this girl came in with her tarot deck and started pulling cards. And I was like, whoa, it's like the addiction <laughs> came back. And I was like, like, what? Because I wasn't allowed to use them. <laughs> it was like a no go. And I like... I was like, hey, what are you doing? And so she had the Rider Waite Smith. So she showed them to me and she's now my friend. <laughs> we are now friends. <laughs> um, and she had taken like a two year tarot course and knew them all. And I was like, so cool. And I ran home, but I only had the Alice in Wonderland deck, which is pretty close to the Rider Waite, but I felt like I wanted her deck. So I went and got the Rider Waite Smith deck and then started like pulling cards and trying to learn. Because before, obviously I was just liked the images and like what the little things on the cards were like the story and symbolism but I didn't know that there was actually like like a thing to it so mm. it was fun to dive in like I love her and I love that art but I just felt like I would get stuck on the human when I would look at them when I spread them out I just saw humans what I wanted to see was like a fairy tale where I could see that they enter a scene something happens and then it will take you to a finale card or like what you've pulled and I wasn't getting that from the humans I would get too distracted that it's a male or it's a female or whatever I wanted it to feel like the story still wanted the secret of Nim but me to be in it yes <laughs> I wanted to be the main character and I felt like that was easier for me to slip into as like stories and creatures and that kind of thing it felt too like human problems and I wanted more of like narrative story like how do I Come something rather than will this person and this person get together and i had more journey questions i love I didn't that connect i always wondered about this some people have talked to me about i don't like cards with people in them and i thought why but now i have a better understanding from you saying that you can be the central being in the story if you're looking at the card and now you have this animal guiding you or you were then the protagonist and it's instead reflective of what's going on that just is hitting me right now for the first time and that totally makes sense linda was such a sweetheart i just loved talking to her i know what a great perspective on tarot mm -hmm. and i recently had someone over at my house who is actually on the spectrum and when she looked at those cards she said, I really appreciate these because they don't have people in them and they're easier for me to read. And I said, exactly. Bingo. We look at so many of those gorgeous cards and hold them up. That's one to watch on YouTube for sure. Check out episode 67, Northern Animal Tarot with Linda Ritter. By the way, just in case you missed last week's episode, you can watch all of our guest episodes on our YouTube channel because, Katie, you have organized our YouTube so that all the guest episodes are in one channel. That's right. You can see an entire playlist of all of our guest episodes from all of the seasons. So they can just play one after another and you can enjoy every juicy bit from all of our amazing guests, which are vast at this point. And of course, while you're there, subscribe, because why would you not? Thank you for being that Virgo organizer. 
If anyone has other suggestions, I love to make more lists. So just drop me an email. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My next selection is a double feature. No selection of mine would be complete without my bestie, my friend, talented witch, the amazing Madam mm. Pamita. Pamita and I go way back. And so that's why I can always <laughs> rely on her to be like, yo, Pam, be a guest on the podcast. She's always good to go. And she's also proven to be one of our most listened to guests. So Madam Pamita has written Madam Pamita's Magical book of tarot she's written the book of candle magic and her latest book is baba yaga's book of witchcraft and we did a double feature on that book it's about you slavic magic specifically ukrainian magic mm -hmm. so check this out one of our best episodes of season two episodes 68 and 69 in this clip when did you first learn about Baba Yaga? Was Baba Yaga a term that you were taught as a child? Or did you learn about this archetype and then learn her name later? I can't remember when I got introduced to her, which tells me it's been since I was a little girl. So I knew about Baba Yaha, we would call her in Ukrainian. Baba Yaga is English version of that. And Baba Yaga is the Russian version of that. In looking at this archetype, I don't know what inspired me to get, I, I do know what inspired me, but I don't know exactly when it happened or when that transition happened. But she's always a kind of secondary character in an antagonist or secondary character in the fairy tale. She doesn't have any old fairy tales that are just about her, but she does show up in hundreds and hundreds of fairy tales pan Slavic fairy tales. So she's variations of her show up in, of course, Russian folk tales, but also Belarus, Poland, Ukraine, Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria. You find these variations of her in Macedonia. You can go into all the Slavic countries and find a Baba Yaga character. We even see a correspondence, which isn't very surprising in some of the Germanic tales. So we have have somebody in Germanic folklore named Frau Perkta or Frau Berta, who is like a wicked old witch who comes around at the fall winter time and she goes around and checks your house to see if it's clean. And if it isn't clean, she whacks you with something, an implement that she's carrying. So this is something that we aren't seeing it like contained by borders. We also see there's like the wicked witch in Hansel and Gretel. So for people who aren't familiar, see, I thought everybody was familiar with her again, because this is the way I grew up. I thought, oh, yeah, everyone at least knows who Baba Yaga is, right? Even if they don't know the stories word for word. But there, I found a lot of people and actually a lot of witches who weren't familiar because I thought maybe, okay, it makes sense that maybe regular people, but witches not being familiar with her was pretty eye-opening for me. So what I like to tell people is that the closest thing that they're probably familiar with, we're mostly talking to people in the States or in Western Europe, is the witch in Hansel and Gretel. The witch in Hansel and Gretel that lures the children in and then she's going to fatten them up and then she's going to put them in the fire and eat them. So in some stories of Baba Yaga, she is that kind of ogre creature who's sole purpose is just to consume something. But even within those stories, there's some deeper significant spiritual meaning that goes back to ancient practices that we can talk about. But I think that these stories where she's an evil character are actually the newer stories, the post Christianity stories. Once Christianity came into Slavic nations in 988 AC, we see that evil version of her. But prior, the older stories tend to focus on her as either very ambiguous, like she could go either way, or she's a donor character of some kind. But her unifying thing is that she's always a crone and always powerful. So she's never depicted as a young woman. She's always old. She's always a little bit intimidating because of her looks, sometimes ugly, just intimidating, wrinkled, old looking, but she's extremely powerful. So whether you're going to her and she's going to eat you, or you're going to her and she's going to give you a magical gift, that's where we see this unifying theme. And that's the essence of her is that she is a forest witch. She is solitary witch. She is a crone. And she's extremely powerful. And we go back in lore and legend and we see the forest mother or the forest grandmother as this caretaker of the forest realm. And really that's who she is. And that is going back to her oldest pagan roots. And this is the way 
her story was continued to be carried on, even in Christian times, is, oh, I'm just telling a fairy tale about the spirit or a little, hey, don't go there. Baba Yaga is going to get you. Those kind of statements would be said. That's really who she is versus who she has evolved to be understood to be. So she's that spirit that people would go to. And if we look at those old stories, people go to her with a question, a problem, or a need of some kind. And then she oftentimes will test the person. Sometimes she doesn't test them and she gives them something and then they go on their way. That's when she just makes a cameo appearance in a story. But the ones where she's more involved, it usually involves some kind of test. So you're going to do this thing. And at the end, if you accomplish it, I'll give you the result, which also relates to the story Rumpelstiltskin. The girl needs to spin the whole room of flax into gold or straw into gold or whatever. And once she gets the help, the magical help and accomplishes this, then she gets the reward. So those stories, we see blending and crossover in the stories. So Baba Yaga would often give a test of some kind. And then usually in the stories, there's like a, let's say the the good girl and the lazy girl and the good girl will do all the things and then she'll get some reward. And then this evil stepmother says, Oh, I want my daughter to get that reward too. It's just, she sends the lazy daughter off to do. And of course the lazy daughter doesn't accomplish the things. And then she gets some kind of terrible thing happening to her. But what that tells us is also, it tells us about ancient spiritual practices of initiation. This is an initiation when you're ready to go on to being the healer of the community or join the group of healers or join the group of warriors or join the group of uh, house builders, you would go through some initiation process. An initiation process, a good initiation process is not meant to keep you out, but meant to prove to yourself and to the higher ups that you're ready for that next step. So whether you're being initiated into the world of adults or whatever, you're going to go through an initiation of some kind. In Pillion culture and old cultures that existed 7,000 years ago on the land that's now Ukraine and Hungary and Moldova, these areas, or sorry, Romania, not Hungary, Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine, these areas had Tripillion cultures. There's lots of different cultures that existed, Neolithic cultures that existed at this time. But we see a very interesting thing. In Tripillion culture, they would have initiation huts. These initiation huts would look like the power animal of the group. If your tribe or your city was the badger, your little initiation hut would look like a badger and you would go in through the door of the mouth of the badger into the badger. So there's an act of consuming that we see in the Baba Yaga stories. She's going to eat you, which is also an initiation, a symbolic initiation. And these huts that they would have out in the woods, far away, you go to the initiation hut, were animal shaped and stood on legs, four legs. What do we see with Baba Yaga's house? It has chicken legs. It is quasi anthropomorphic. It's alive. And you go in through the door into that other world, into that world of the spirits. When you enter in, just like you go into the initiation hut, you are going to meet your teacher and be tested. And then emerge from the hut with the gift of being initiated, or you're not ready this year, kid, come back next year, right? That's really her role is an initiator. And when you start to see the stories through that lens, they're all initiations, whether she's putting you into the fire, into the oven, which for Ukrainians was the symbolic home of the spirits, the peach, the oven was the home where the ancestors lived. So it's not, I'm just going to eat you, or I'm just going to burn you. I'm putting you into the world of spirit. Oh, you avoided that. You escaped it this time. So you're not going yet to that world of the spirit. That's another initiation. So we see her as a really very fascinating, very complex and teaching us about old ways when these things weren't documented. Madame Pamita and her shop, Parlor of Wonders, has been an amazing resource throughout these entire two years of Knit a Spell. We are always grabbing our go-to oils or beeswax candles. How many yes. times have we used her stuff, right? Even in episode 100, which I referenced last week, we used so many of her products to improve our luck, including the Billiken coin, her good luck oil, her good luck horseshoe candle, good luck potion. I even put together her lucky seven 
gambler's mojo bag just to help increase my odds. Really, yeah. it is such high quality products. And I, for one, feel good about knowing that it's coming from a good source, someone who's yeah. legit. Yeah. And very low waste and low carbon footprint packaging and all of that. So we're not sponsored by her, but we really enjoy working with someone who's so eco-conscious and has such high quality products. So check out Madame Pamita. We'll have her on again. I know mm -hmm. episode 68 and 69 to hear the full episode and our whole conversation. The next episode that is on my list, episode 71, Ooh. another friend of mine, Laura Tempest-Sakroff. I used to cat sit for her because she used to be my neighbor. But of course, you'll know her because she's a prolific visual artist. Her paintings are amazing and a prolific author. Not to mention, she's an amazing dancer. And we talked to her about her deck. She has an amazing Anatomy of a Witch Oracle deck. Yes. And she has a particular card in there that has a hand on it. Hello. Duh. That, duh. The card that I was really into. So I wanted to know her perspective on that card. And so this is one of my favorite clips. I know. Okay, Jim wants to know <laughs> about like, the hand. Oh, the hand. <laughs> well, that means I know a lot about these symbols, but I want to hear from you. So for the folks who, who aren't watching along, hmm. we have the Manofiga, the Mano Cornuta, and then we have the Hamsa or the uh, Hand of Fatima. It's all mixed in there. And those are three big important ones to me. There are so many other things that we could have done, but the two, particularly on the end, the medallions, I'm wearing a Mano Cornuta right now. I also have lots of Manifigas. <laughs> <laughs> very heavy into Mediterranean culture as a symbol of protection, empowerment, as well as a bit rude. <laughs> it has some rude, some of them have a bit more rude meanings to them. And then also as somebody who's been involved in folkloric and Middle Eastern and Arabic dance, all the variations that the hand of Fatima, which also crosses over into Jewish culture. So again, that comes down through the line. And then the eye, the seeing eye within that. So against the evil eye. So another layer of protection and this connection and peace to it. But the kind of the fun pun for that card too, and in, in the prescription for it, because there's a description and then there's a prescription is like, you need to get hands on. So when you get this, it's like, all right, stop being like, I'm just going to do a meditation. And it's all right, what physical things are you going to get active? What are you going to do with your hands? Hopefully you can do something, right? That is crafty, that is alternating things, not just thinking about it, reading about it, listening about it, but doing the thing. So that's brought into it too. I love this because yes. you have a snake around the egg. You have a also that image holding the paintbrushes with the music out of it. This is a very much knit a spell type of card. Yeah. Got so the little needles in there. Your ability to draw hands is unparalleled. <laughs> I never can. <laughs> so that's all about the hand, Katie. But there's so much more in that episode. Oh, yeah. Her entire deck is so comprehensive. Plus, it comes with a very detailed book. This one is actually really valuable and really features her excellent writing skill. Not to mention the incredible artwork. So this is oh. one to watch. Check out the entire episode 71 with Laura tempest Zakroff. Our next clip features one of the people who has been on Knit a Spell most often. Episode 73, So Witchy with Rachel Henderson. Rachel Henderson came out with this amazing book, so beautifully photographed, so gorgeously put together, so well written. It's so right up our alley. Such magical fiber art and sewing projects and I don't know. Is there knitting projects in there? There's a few, right? I don't think so. I think it was more about the sewing, but trust me, there's so much that could apply to any craft. Even the section on when things go wrong and you've checked your sewing machine and this and that and everything's in good order, but things aren't still working. Have you checked your metaphysical self, your metaphysical yes. tools? Right. I was like, oh, that of course applies to knitting and everything else. Her perspective on practical magic and magic making right up our alley. Yeah. 
And this was the first time we had Rachel on the podcast. I think this clip will show you why it was a no-brainer to have Rachel back on the show, which we did several times. Check yes. it out. Part of the reason I love this book is because so many correspondences, and I like people with differing opinions on how they feel about stuff because you can go online and find basic correspondences for colors and whatnot and it's all the same and that's fine but what about m more new stuff and new ideas and other people with yeah. other ideas and i really loved how you had not only just like tool correspondences but what if something goes wrong what if you want to incorporate Didi into it they were really more layered ideas even though it is quite a beginner book it can take you on a further journey than some, which I really appreciated. I really feel that a lot of magic is very personal. I liken it to language in mm -hmm. that if I say cat, all three of us and everybody listening are going to have a different picture in their head. We may all imagine a domestic cat, but it's going to be different colors. It's going to be a different length of hair, all of that. And I feel that way for correspondences that pink okay romantic love and there's going to be other stuff but people have their own internal emotions and contexts and if you come from a background where romantic love has either it's something you've longed for or something that's been withheld or something that has been used to hurt you you're going to have a different relationship to that correspondence than somebody else and i feel that it's great to have and i provide correspondences in the book, but it's always good going back to this idea of Book of Shadows to just sit with yourself and go, okay, what does this color actually, what does this herb actually mean to me? What does any of this and to how can I incorporate that in my magic and not let somebody say, you really should be using this rather than that. No, I'll just use my thing. Thank you very much. And you do your thing and everything will be fine. Love that. Okay, so obviously it's a love fest between you and me and Rachel Henderson, right? Yes. Oh, you can learn more about Rachel Henderson. Check out episode 73, So Witchy in Full. And you can just search Rachel Henderson on knitaspell.com or on our YouTube and listen uh, to full episodes that feature Rachel Henderson. She's been in three of our episodes already, so one of our no absolutely our most reoccurring guest so far and jim said absolutely for a reason yeah okay i'm ready for a cocktail yes please are you ready for a cocktail i'll take one good our friend runa troy in episode 86 this was around the holiday around yuletide and runa came on talking all about mixing magical cocktails and mocktails in a whole new way Runa was a fantastic guest and her storytelling was so great. Mm -hmm. So check out this cocktail. Your mouth will be watering when you hear what she has to say about it. Check this out. Speaking of spirits, is there like that nostalgic beverage from your past that comes to mind? Oh, yes. It's actually the very first ritual of drink that I was ever exposed to. And it's a Tom and Jerry it is a old school cocktail made with eggs and butter and mm. Christmas spices and brandy and rum. And it was something that was always featured at my paternal grandparents' house during the winter holidays. It was topped with whipped cream too, which was especially enticing <laughs> to the little ones. We were allowed sips, but there weren't enough mugs to go around except for the adults. So we'd be like, mom, can I have a drink, can I have a drink? But it's frothy and boozy and creamy and spicy all in one, like my family. So it's definitely something that I remember. This is on your paternal grandparent side? Yes, my Pepe and Gigi. And wasn't Pepe a little bit of a mixologist himself? Yeah. To give you a little bit of background, my father comes from a family of nine children. He's got three sisters and, or three brothers, excuse me, and five sisters. And families were big like that back then. Birth control was wonky at best. And my mm. maternal grandmother comes from a family of 10. So I was surrounded by people all the time. So it's no surprise that big punch bowls 
were brought out when the family all got together because it really went a ways to feed and drink a big gathering like that. And I remember my Pepe, he would be so proud of his Tom and Jerry's. God, I would love to have his Tom and Jerry set too, but he was tasting it and you have to separate a dozen eggs and the butter has to be the right temperature. And he was mixing and tasting and mixing and tasting. And he looked like this potions wizard Mm. hovering over it and everything like that. And I remember sitting in the basement bar watching him do this. And it was very hypnotic. Now, today I can say that I was getting those alpha and theta brainwaves going and being very meditative. And that's why I remember this particular moment. But my one uncle, the youngest of the uncles put more brandy in in it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So his intention was like to spike it or make it a little more like, let's get lit or something. Yeah. Let's get lit. Let's have fun. And my Pepe was furious. He was a pretty easygoing guy. You would have to have nine kids, but he was so mad. And he made my uncle go out in the winter and go get more ingredients so he could start it all over again. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because he didn't see my uncle do it. He tasted it. He knew it had been messed with. (laughs) And you were messing with the energy that he put in. He made this with so much love and care and intention that everyone would feel welcome and loved and cared for. And my uncle messed that up and he was none too happy. So it wasn't about getting effed up. It wasn't about like Mm -mm. drinking. Mm -mm. It was about Mm -mm. the recipe and the ingredients and the Absolutely. Absolutely. Finding the balance. Yeah. Yeah. Our yules for any families and definitely for mine were fraught with family squabbles and drama and that. And I'm sure that once I left Detroit, my life choices were gossiped about at that bar over the Tom and Jerry sponge and stuff like that. (laughs) But, you know, in my crone mission to seek peace and sanctuary, that's none of my business. But at that time as a child, I look and I was like, yeah, that's not okay. You can't do that. So that kind of sticks in my mind. There was a lot of magic to it. And it was labor intensive. Separating a dozen eggs, that's no easy feat. Today, it's a little bit easier. We got all these cool kitchen tools and stuff. But for my grandfather, that wasn't the case at all. You can buy egg whites at the store in a (laughs) carton. Right. There you go. And then the butter having to be at the right temperature and that. So I've taken that and created my own version of it, which is a whole lot easier and a whole lot more accessible for people. And I'm calling it good forward nog because I want to take the good of my ancestors, that care and that love and leave the squabbles and the drama behind. So in this case, the ingredients are just as important as the intention. Absolutely. And and so what makes this recipe easier than the original? (laughs) Because you don't have to make the Tom and Jerry's batter, right? You have to do that ahead of time. And it can look a little not good. The batter (laughs) itself doesn't look that appetizing. And a lot of times, depending on what's going on, I'll make this individually for folks. So I use eggnog instead. It's basically the same ingredients. It's readily available anymore for anybody. And you save a little bit of calories because you're not using the butter, but the way that you mix it and the things that you mix it with allows for that creaminess and that good mouth feel of a Tom and Jerry. We'll have a link to the recipe in the show notes. So you don't have to (laughs) have a pen and write everything down. Give us an overview of how we might do this. It's eggnog. So you can support your local dairy because they all put out eggnog at this time of year. Some of them are plain. Some of them already have the spices in it. It's okay. It doesn't matter, whatever. You're still going to add more spices because that's what makes it so good. The eggnog holds the energy of new beginnings and abundance. And it's important for the intention of why we're making and consuming the good forward nog. You want that new beginning. You want the abundance because with those things, you can take the good forward, right? It has aged rum, which holds the energy of strength because you're going to need some strength to 
discard the generational traumas or negativity you want to leave in the past that you've gotten from your family of origin or whatever. You could use this particularly in whatever you want to take forward as far as the positivity goes. It has brandy, which has for ages been used for health. And I love me some good brandy. For sure. Um, it, it's also holds the energy of prosperity. So you have abundance with the eggs, you have a prosperity with the brandy because mm -hmm. you want to continue to move forward in the good. Which um, makes sense because the brandy is distilled from grapes and that has that symbolism. Oh, right. Rum is distilled. It depends. Rum can be distilled from different things, but good rum is distilled from sugar cane. Mm -hmm. And those both have that energy that comes from them. And this I is aged that. rum in this recipe too. It's been cooking for a while. Ooh, yeah, this is more. great. I see where you're going. Okay, keep going. And then there's whipped cream, which is about luxury. Mm. And then all those spices like cinnamon and cloves and nutmeg. That's life full of love right there. Oh. Oh. My Taurus moon is in love with this cocktail. <laughs> Yes. Sweet and delicious and spicy. Oh my gosh. Yes. And warm. And that's what we need right now. We need that warmth. The biggest lesson to learn from this episode, don't mess with someone else's potions. No, don't add more booze. Even if it's a big bowl of punch, don't spike the punch bowl. Do it at prom. Not somebody's house. brew that they've made for five hours, uh, packing like a hundred eggs to do it and getting geez. it just right. No. Just add more booze in your cup. <laughs> yeah, spike your own cup. Yeah, that was really fun with Runa. I can't wait to have her on in the future. Yes, and all of her delicious recipes are still linked in our show notes. So be sure to check those out as well. Yeah. And her Patreon, which is awesome. Her Patreon, her email list, everything that Runa does is fantastic. Yes, indeed. All right. Our next episode is Tarot in Love with the Reverend Dr. Elliot oh, Adam. <laughs> I love him. This was such a great episode. Episode 95. And that wraps up my picks for season two. But let's just talk about this episode. Tarot in Love is Dr. Elliot Adams' latest book. His book is all about how you can do love readings or look at the tarot through the lens of love in all aspects of love, romantic, platonic, self-love, all those aspects. And after having Elliot on my Meet a Mystic show that is currently on hiatus, I knew he had a wonderful story, has wonderful stories, and is a fantastic tarot reader. So we talked to Elliot about his new book, and he addresses why do so many people ask about love readings. As a reader, the number one question I get asked about is love, relationships. When am I going to meet somebody? Is the person I'm with the one for me? Sometimes readers get asked this so often, it can even get a little annoying. I write about this in Tarot and Love. You'll get the client who is with the absolute worst human being, so abusive, so negative, and they're calling the tarot reader and they want the tarot reader to tell them that this relationship's okay. And that actually everything's gonna be fine. They just have to stick it out. And it doesn't matter if you're going through abuse, you're in love, which somehow makes you someone who should stick in this through thick and thin and no matter what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And I was having a conversation in the yard with my sister and that's how this book got started. And we were talking about relationship readings. And I was saying, why is it that people are asking these questions with individuals who aren't respecting them or caring for them? What is that saying to them? And then I had to remember, oh, I remember a time in my life before I got married when I was looking for love and I was accepting all sorts of relationship behavior that was subpar because I didn't really know, number one, my own worth. And I also didn't know how a healthy, functional relationship should transpire. And so I was thinking, you know what? I think I'd like to write a book to my younger self, the version of me that was long ago looking for love, just desperate to find that, and who had to find out that love doesn't come first to validate you, and then your life is happily ever after. Oftentimes, what we learn is that we have to go toward our own best life. We have to 
go through this journey of loving ourselves, warts and all, everything that we don't like, and to really get so enthusiastic about our own life that we put out a different frequency. Because people who come to me for a love reading and they're desperate, when am I going to meet him? I just want to have a relationship. Do you realize you're going out into the world with that energy and people can perceive that? Isn't that repellent? If someone was like that to you, wouldn't you be like, get away? I don't want your needy, clingy energy. Ugh. But if you are someone who's saying, you know what? I am involved in school right now. I'm building a business. I have this wonderful job. I love my life so much. I'm going to go travel. I have so much fun in my daily life that I don't need somebody to complete me. I'm having a great time. I love me. And if I meet someone great, that's the cherry on the Sunday. but I'm not looking at this relationship as my last meal. It's mm -hmm. a totally different vibe. And when you're in that space, you attract love. It's like magic. People are like, who is that? What kind of energy do they have? I want to get to know that person. They're powerful. They're confident. So I wrote Tarot and Love to address the energy we bring into our relationships, to make people self-aware. The book can tell you a lot about what another person might be feeling about you, but what it more can teach you is what do you need to learn about yourself? Why is this annoying card coming up over and over in your love reading that you're not wanting to hear? What is that saying about you? Because if you can get your breakthrough, the relationship's going to follow suit. All right. Now we know. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Everything has been solved thanks to him. Just yeah. grab a copy of his book, Tarot in Love, and you'll know exactly how to deal with questions about love and how to address your own questions for love yes. as well. Check out episode 95, Tarot in Love, with Dr. Elliot Adam in full. It is really a fantastic treat. I think the hardest part of doing these episodes, Katie, is how do we just pick? We could just do a four-hour. I think that's what we need to do. We need to do a four-hour podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And just sure. enumerate at length and rebroadcast every one of our favorite moments Perfect. for four hours. I think people would stay on for four hours. Yeah, while we're at it, why don't we make season three just replaying all of season two? That'd be great. <laughs> so much easier for me. <laughs> that was really the hardest part was choosing and editing down oh, just yeah. a few of the clips that were so meaningful because there were so many others. There were so many moments that were just so great. And yeah. how could we remember them all throughout an entire year? And as we're even talking about this, it's, oh, and this, oh, and this. Yeah. Remember so, Jennifer Sidley, remember with that moment with your brother. Oh man. Teresa Reed, like how I, just another reason for every one of our listeners, if they're interested, to just hop on over to our YouTube channel and watch them all in a row. Binge watch them this weekend, why don't you? That's right. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening. Next week we have something super fun planned. Yes. I am surprising Katie with questions that she has not seen. So a lot yes. of times we do work from scripts and from things that we have talked about and planned. Mm -hmm. We are surprising each other with questions yes. we have not prepared for. We're springing it on each other. We have to answer in the moment. So this will be like a super fun, can you answer on your toes type of experience. And Katie has questions for me and I'm That's just right. going to have to answer them on the fly. So I have no idea what's going to happen next week. A little scared. It's Jim's favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's like a roller coaster. I'm scared, but I know I'm safe. My I promise dude. I'll be gentle. Oh, Jim, I can't wait. And for our <laughs> listeners, get ready because you'll definitely learn some stuff about us that you did not know in next week's episode. So until then, Jim, thanks for sharing your thoughts on all of our awesome guests that we've had over the past year. All right. See you then. Bye-bye. Thanks, for, Thanks listening. for listening. If you enjoyed the show, consider sharing it with a friend, leaving a review on iTunes and Spotify, or following Knit a Spell on Instagram. You can also subscribe to the Light from Lantern YouTube channel to enjoy full episodes of Knit a Spell and see our happy faces. You can also learn more about readings, classes, and events going on with your favorite maker of magic, James Divine, by visiting thedivinehand.com and subscribing to his newsletter. Then follow Jim's fun and interactive Instagram account at Divine Hand Jim. 
keep up with Katie, the magical maker, by subscribing to her newsletter at lightfromlantern.com. You'll receive a free knitting pattern as a thank you gift. Then follow Katie on Instagram at lightfromlantern for even more magical making tips. See you See next, next week. week.